The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to the webinar Step-by-Step -step Guide for Implementing a Successful FLS. I am Muriel, I work at the International Osteoporosis Foundation and it's my great pleasure to introduce you our outstanding speaker, Professor Christina Akesson, today. Um, Professor Ak Christina Akesson is the chair of the Capture the Fracture program, uh, who, which focuses on facilitating FLS implementation. And she is Professor of Orthopedic at the Malmo University Hospital in Sweden, and she's been initiating and establishing a fracture lesion service for the last 15 years. Before we start, I would like to uh, just point out that if you have any question during this webinar, please ask them in the question or the chat box on, the, on your panel, and we will voice them for you at the end of the presentation of Professor Akesson. Thank you very much, and over to you, uh, Professor Akesson. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to see so many of you here this morning. We are now going to discuss how to implement the uh, Fracture Liaison Service. Uh, as you all know, that fr fragility fractures is a consequence of osteoporosis as un and underlying frailty. And here you see an array of the different fractures that we are commonly discussing. This lecture will cover fracture liaison service step-by-step -step implementation. The first part of this, this process is to understand the need for an FLS, the FLS implementation, FLS business planning process, and the multi-sector uh, FLS coalition, and then I will end with a case model. What we know, and which is part of the case and why we need fracture liaison service, is that if you've had one fracture, you are very likely to get more fractures. And the problem, the fact that too few people who have a fracture are treated uh, to avoid new fractures. This is data from Sweden where we do have a very high incidence of fractures and this is the last data where you see that on average only 14% are receiving uh, nationally in the different regions uh, treat, pharmacological treat, treatment 6 to 12 months after a fragility fracture. So treatment to reduce risk is not uh, a recurrence is not undertaken. This is not true only for Sweden but this is not true only for Sweden but also for, the, for Europe in all. And this is data from a paper presented two years ago where reviewing treatment and the treatment gap in Europe. And you can see all the red bars are where those who are not treated and the blue ones are the ones who are treated. And this is true then for both men and women that those who should have treatment are not receiving it. I'd also like to show you that there are site-specific patterns of osteoporotic fractures. So when we discuss fracture liaison service, we also have to look at who gets what fracture at what time in life. And this is data showing that between the age 50 and 54, you can see that forearm fractures is the most uh, prominent fracture. And while hip fractures are only 4% of the fractures, as you see up here. However, when you get into the elderly, those who are, for example, between 85 and 89 years of age. Hip fracture is the majority of fracture, and these terrageous fractures are only 10%. However, at all time points, other types of fracture that we normally don't discuss are also very common. And this could be fractures of the lower limb and fracture of the upper arm as well. So we are aware that we have a management gap. The first factor is a sentinel event, and healthcare institutions are failing to respond to the first fracture. The underlying causes of incident fractures remain underdiagnosed and undertreated, and pharmacological interventions have not been shown to substantially lower the risk uh, have been shown to substantially lower the risk of subsequent fractures. Still, they're not used. 
So when we discuss fragility fractures, I think we have to look at from the beginning because we have to look at the comprehensive fragility fracture management. This includes from the start of the fracture, the medical management, the surgical management, the post-operative management and rehabilitation, and the management to avoid uh, or re reduce the risk of recurrence. We have a toolbox. We already know what to do. We have standardized management processes, care plans, we have checklists, and we have an experienced staff. However, we add, need to add the final step to have a coordinated systematic fracture liaison service as well in order to properly take care of these patients. And fra secondary fracture prevention is more effective than primary prevention. And secondary prevention is, as you know, avoidance of new fractures and recurrence. A systems approach with automatic capture of the patients is necessary. If it's done randomly, we are not at all as successful as we are if we put it into the system, whatever healthcare system we are working in. And when it's also done systematically, it has been shown to be cost-saving. So, implementation of an FLS. How do you build an efficient and sustainable FLS? Because there are many who have tried and made it for a period of time, but it's not been sustainable. So a fracture liaison service has a specific structure. It's, it's, it's initiated when a new fracture presents, either at the emergency room or if it's identified by the x-ray department. Most of the patients are taken care of by uh, orthopedic trauma uh, rooms or emergency department. All depends on your healthcare system. Some of the patients are then inpatients that needs most commonly a surgery. Other patients are treated at the outpatient clinic, for example, proximal humerus fractures or dysteragus fractures. At this time point, it's important that someone identifies those who are related to osteoporosis so that secondary measures can be undertaken to avoid recurrence. And this is osteoporosis treatment, false risk assessment, exercise programs, education programs, and actually many other interventions, particularly in the very old, for example, reducing the number of total medications. The systems approach is essential, and that means that it's within the system as a natural and integrated par, uh, part of the care pathway. We call it today fracture liaison service. The term was coined in Glasgow, but depending on your language, it may not be a useful term, so there are many other ways of describing it, such as fracture chain, fragility fracture nurse, coordinator led fracture service, case managers, but as I say, in, in many languages, you will have many names. And this is also a schematic picture of how it can work. You have the coordinator as the spider in the web, who is in charge of the identification of the fracture patients, whether they're inpatients or outpatients, who is also coordinating the investigations, which is the initial starts with the risk assessment, and for those where it's necessary, bone mineral density measurements who is also coordinating the interventions that are undertaken, whether they are undertaken where the fracture patient is identified, or whether it's done in primary care. Again, all depending on your healthcare system. The, the final step is the interaction, information, and follow-up. Because as we know, any of the measures that we are initiating for osteoporosis also have problems with adherence. And, in the, and again, depending on your system, this may be done in primary care or it may be done by a specialist. But this gives you an overview picture of how the organization of a fracture liaison service is preferably done. When it comes to implementation of secondary fracture uh, prevention programs, it firstly, of course, needs to be initiated. And actually, that's the first hurdle. It needs to be systematic. It's not sufficient with just one person doing it because it needs to go into the system to be sustainable. It needs to be coordinated and that's what we have found through all the studies that are done and the reports that have been presented that it needs a coordinator, one person who is in charge because otherwise it tends to fall between the chairs. 
it needs to be politically acceptable. And so far, it hasn't. Politicians, public, and also other healthcare providers think it's a natural thing that you have a fracture and there's nothing to do. So we have to present a case that's acceptable to the politicians or to those who are payers in order to initiate it. It needs to be adapted to the healthcare system wherever you are. And we already know today through the Capture the Fracture campaign, for example, that it is applicable to virtually all healthcare systems. And of course, to anyone, it needs to be cost effective. The steps towards the implementation then also have to be uh, at the different levels, which is the local level, where you have your hospital department or clinic. And this can be an orthopedic department, but it can also be a joint venture with orthogeriatrics or with those who are the osteoporosis specialists, which may be in endocrinology or rheumatology, as this varies throughout uh, your individual countries or actual individual sites or cities. Many places it also needs to have a regional acceptance because the country, county governments or hospital trusts, healthcare management organizations are those who are actually running the day-to-day -day healthcare in that region. And this is both the, both the payer and the policymaker. But most importantly, if it has a national priority, it is much more likely to be happening uh, within a country and then down to the individual hospital. This is where lobbying needs to be done to the healthcare uh, departments, the national health services, other government governing regulatory or financial stakeholders, private health care providers, and healthcare insurance organizations. Again, the array of, of stakeholders mirrors how different our healthcare systems are around the world. The key components uh, within an FLS, the first one is identification of the fracture patients. Sounds relatively easy, but can be more difficult than expected, particularly if you have large volumes of patients and you have to have a logistics in place. The investigation and risk assessment is the second step in this uh, as a key component. Then interventions that need to be initiated against osteoporosis, but also against falls and information and insurance of adherence. Furthermore, there needs to be an interaction with the decision levels uh, for implementation and finally data acquisition. Normally we talk about the five I's, the identification, investigation, intervention and information. And these are easy words to keep track of when you initiate your system. But we also have to have key partners in this in order to be successful. These are the P's, the patient organizations here, national osteoporosis societies or other societies representing older people are key in pushing the issue because the patients actually want this care. We also have professional organizations of physicians uh, of various specialties primary care management team, and the post-acute care teams, which is an extended view of looking at the professionals here, where we have occupational therapists, physiotherapists, rehabilitations, but also out in the society where the social care in the communities are taking over, and they are, for, for example, essential for prevention programs. In order to make this work, we also have to discuss with politicians and policy makers, which may not be exactly the same people, and also the payers, which may be public or insurance, and pharmaceutical manufacturers of various kinds. So these are our partners, and none of them can be forgotten if you want to be successful in implementing an FLS. Other key components is to set the target and target the standards to measure against. We will go back and look at that for the best practice framework, which is setting the standards and that you can measure against. You also, for your own individual setting, need to define achievable goals at your own site. Because if you start too big and uh, 
look at those who have been working for many years, it may seem impossible to start a fracture liaison service. However, you can always start where you stand and be able to do, make a difference just by starting small. And in doing this, a key component for every site is to have a local logistics, which includes IT support. So the, when you look at the, implement, the direct implementation, it's important to create a multidisciplinary FLS project team. This is the starting point. And from doing so, we have reviewed what are the key players in this. And firstly, it almost always starts with a lead clinician or local champion, someone with the enthusiasm to drive this forward. This person cannot, however, work alone, and the first person to be engaged is the fracture coordinator. Of course, since I showed you before, the majority of fractures are treated within orthopedics. So orthopedic surgeons or orthopedic departments need to be involved. The degree of involvement may vary, but the most important thing is that it's within the orthopedic department, is within the system to have a fracture coordinator, to be aware and to make sure that fragility fracture patients are identified. Because then whoever is running the coordinator service or FLS service may be a secondary care clini clinician, such as the rheumatologist or the endocrinologist, who is actually in charge of the osteoporosis unit. This will also vary. In some places it's within orthopedics directly, in other places it's not. We may also have other nurse specialists involved, particularly when it comes to certain drugs that need to be administered to the patients. We all, we all have to have primary care physicians who also can follow up and ensure adherence to therapy, but also can be responsible for the non-pharmacological interventions together with the allied health professionals. Uh, public health consultants are important in many systems, but it does depends on how you have your funding. In some cases, this is not the person who is involved because in open systems, they may work differently. However, a service manager or administrators at the department level uh, is important, as well as then the final person who is a uh, pharmacist. To design an FLS service model is the next step when you want to implement, a, implement an FLS. This is quite an interesting step, and I would suggest that the entire team meets for a brainstorming session, because then you can also maintain the enthusiasm of working with this. And quite a few people need to be involved to also make it work, not only uh, long term, but, but in the short run. To write the specific and time-dependent aims and objectives is what you start with. You, will, you identify how you will capture the fragility fracture patients, write a case finding protocols for the appropriate setting for inpatients, for fracture clinic, for diagnostic imaging, etc. And that this requires quite a few uh, just hands on things. And you decide what to include in your service model. And I will show you the best practice framework, which gives you guidance uh, as how to work. And of course, ensure that all members endorse the model, which, as I said, everyone should be there uh, from the beginning to get ownership to it, because that's important for the long-term success. This is the best practice framework. This has been developed by the Fracture Working Group of the IOF, and it's 13 internationally endorsed standards to guide an FLS. They start with patient identification, patient continue with patient evaluation, post-fracture assessment timing, vertebral fracture identification, assessment guidelines, secondary causes of osteoporosis uh, investigation for this, false prevention service, a multifaceted assessment which includes all the other aspects but that increase fracture risk, medication initiation, medication review, 
uh, which is also sustainability of treatment or continued adherence, a communication strategy and long-term management, and finally, uh, the access to databases to be able to show uh, the success of a factually awesome awesome service and the cost effectiveness. As you see, the standards are developed into uh, three levels, the bronze, the silver, and the gold. And this is on this slide is shown for patient identification and also for medication initiation, where bronze levels is that 50% of the patients are starting the treatment, silver is 70% of the patients, and gold is 90% of the patients. The best practice framework can then be used to help you develop your FLS, uh, since these are the building blocks that we have found that every FLS need to have. You may not be able to use all of them at, at immediately, but these are the key stones, and you can develop your FLS further on using this as a guide. The steps towards implementation then are quite many. I would say that some of them is to secure the access to post-fracture patients. It's difficult to do it immediately after the fracture. The patients have to recover a bit from their fracture because otherwise they will not really be open to discuss osteoporosis. But the most important step is to find them and identify them and not lose them in that intervening time period. When you develop your FLS, you also have to estimate the workload and the resources needed. For the most part, it's very good to start small and then to continue to build it, because otherwise it may be quite overwhelming and the risk of failure is greater. Because, and if you fail, it's sort of a lost cause for, a few, for quite some time, because it's difficult to restart again. It's also important to define the role of the coordinator, and this may vary uh, locally. Uh, some coordinate, and it depends on who is employing the coordinator, if it's directly employed by the, the orthopedic department, or if it's employed by the osteoporosis uh, clinic. So this is something that needs to be worked out, and whether the os coordinator is not only identifying patients, but also participating in later steps, such as treating uh, with the several of the drugs or having osteoporosis schools or other parts in, an, in, in a complete uh, FLS. It's important to engage with the local planning machinery and start prospective data collection, because anyone would like to see how well this works, and you will within immediately or within a year be asked for how many patients have you reviewed and what difference has it made. But the, to initiate the service, uh, and to, so this is to initiate the service and develop it iteratively. But the implementation is what we normally do in clinic and we're quite familiar with, but it's also a key success factor uh, in an FLS to uh, the business planning process. Because this is where you present your case to those who are the partners, the key partners. Here, it, the key partners are local, but they may also be national. So early engagement of the clinical leads in a proposed FLS, local hospital and health care, health system administrators, is usually essential if you want to have a sustainable FLS. A clear understanding of the management gap and impossibility to describe it in simple terms. You will have had a few slides in this lecture, but you will have them in the, uh, the coming webinars and the previous webinar webinars as well, to make it simple, understandable for those who are outside. Identification of where secondary fractures prevention uh, features in the national clinical guidelines, particularly in those that are considered mandatory and a national health care policy. But if you haven't reached to a national health care policy, this is part of the work uh, that we need to continue to do, even if we have established an FLS. And fully develop a fully costed business plan. Health economic models are inevitable in country-specific on account of cost, 
and savings associated with reduction, reduced incidence in subsequent fractures vary between different countries and there are different healthcare systems. But we need to be aware of that in order to get the credibility and the possibility for large-scale implementation beyond our own clinic as well. We also have to look, uh, discuss in terms of multi-sector uh, fracture liaison service coalition, which is actually ac advocacy also at the national level. By establishing an, ex an exemplar system or a local system that we can use and draw attention to, we can also be able to advocate on a larger scale. And when you get it on the larger scale, you also get the possibility to get it as a priority in the healthcare system, and that's when it's as success, it will be an integrated part that's national, uh, natural to any healthcare system. For this, data collection is key, and it's also essential to have a coalition of all the relevant professional and patient societies. Uh, many countries have defined national implementation guidelines, but so far, FLS have not been in the guidelines, they've been more discussing in terms of what treatments to choose, but now we have sufficient data to also have FLS within the national guidelines. We also then have to conduct national audits of all current secondary factor prevention units so we can show that there is an, a change uh, occurring. And with that it's possible to seek government supported policy working group to achieve uniform best practice. But as you know, we now can also measure against the IOF best practice framework. But in order to be complete, have reached the highest levels of success, it's important to have a national uh, policy for implementation of FLS. And it is possible to achieve. Which comes to political acceptance. Where national guidelines for musculoskeletal conditions such as osteoporosis and pro with provider targets and responsibilities will make a difference. And I will show you the case for what's happening in Sweden uh, based on this. And in order to reach the political acceptance, I would say the patient uh, involvement and the patient advocacy is uh, key. They have a greater possibility to reach the decision makers than commonly does uh, doc, uh, do doctors. This has been quite successful in the UK and this is the prevention package for falls and fracture, a roadmap for a systematic approach and I think this was the, the starting step for many of us when we saw this quite w very well developed uh, way of looking on how to prevent new fractures, starting with the hip fracture patients since they are the most co costly and then continuing with other non-hip fragility fractures and then uh, individuals at high risk and of course all elderly people. But if you start with all elderly people you're much less likely to reach the priority that's essential also for osteoporosis and fragility fractures in comparison with all the other conditions that are arguing for their sake. So if this is possible in, in, in all countries, I think we have done lots of good for all the elderly patients in particular who are at the highest risk of fractures. Another key issue is the financial acceptance. The payer does not perceive the gain. The ones who are running the healthcare is, may in some cases be paid for what they do and do not see the gain in preventive measures or uh, focusing on prevention rather than treatment. However, we have data to say that secondary fracture prevention is cost saving. I'm just showing you two different cases here. The one is from Glasgow, which initiated fracture liaison services, and they have been able to clearly show a, a financial gain, but also a gain to the patient in, since fractures are inflicting on quality of life. And the second is Kaiser Permanente in California, who actually set a target for how much they wanted to reduce new hip fractures. And they have been able to show it by working systematically at all the Kaiser Permanente sites. Uh, 
and this can also then be transformed into a currency, dollars, euros, or any other currency, which is then attractive. However, it's not always paid by the same pocket that pays for the treatment. So this is why we need a proper business plan, again, showing where the financial gains are in order to get this acceptance. And in general, I think there is a move towards more preventive measures because in the long run, this is the most cost-effective way to work. So, having said all this, there are challenges to maintain a sustainable FLS. And I will bring out some of those as well, because otherwise, if you don't know them, it's not possible to address them. One of them is the identification of patients and the tracking systems, where many IT systems are still inadequate, and we often work uh, directly on following through papers and, and trying to find other ways of identifying patients. It, it's just to continue to work with it. I'm sure that the IT system soon will reach a better standard where it's easy to track also fracture patients. And for example, we are continuously working to say that we also need to have these headings in our electronic records so they are searchable immediately. Another one is the adherence to treatment. This is not only related to fracture liaison services, but it's related to treatment of osteoporosis in general. So also here, we are relying on IT support where we need to have reminder systems prompting medication intake, prescription refills and nurse monitoring. So all of this can be done and there are systems who have been quite successful in doing it that you will hear about in later webinars. Transfer patient and information between care providers. In, in systems where the fracture liaison service cannot manage all the patients afterwards, there is a transfer of information, most commonly to primary care. So there needs to be a multi-professional acceptance along the entire treatment chain. And quite a lot of education that needs to be also in those who are seeing the patients in, on a daily or uh, follow-up level, particularly in primary care. Also monitor non-pharmacological interventions is important because these are equally important to reduce the falls. But report systems uh, and support, uh, software are here uh, more difficult compared to following with prescription refills. However, there are ways to overcome this because I think we also need to emphasize on those measures uh, in order to be uh, most successful, particularly in the very old where falls are so frequent. And this leads into the fact that we also need to demonstrate the long-term benefits in order to be able to have uh, sustainable FLS. Facilitators in establishing an FLS. Fortunately, we are at the stage where this is possible. The awareness of the benefits in targeting secondary prevention have increased. Available therapies have reached cost advantages, uh, particularly with generics. There's an increase in interest in the orthopedic community. Advances in surgical management of fragility factors leads, has been leading to an overall better outcome for the patients. And orthogeriatric is gaining ground, which is also important. But least of all, demographics, it will be necessary. There will be a public and patient demand. I've now gone through what you can find in some of the resources on the Capture the Fracture website. This is the Fracture the Capture uh, summary and then the FLS toolkit where I've gone through most of the steps that are involved in the toolkit but you will also find many, much more information in the toolkit and be able to use that in your setting up of a Fracture Liaison Service. So now I will show you a case where implementation is, has been making a change. And it's been a collaboration between professional expertise, patient's voice, and political awareness. In Sweden, we got national guidelines for uh, musculoskeletal conditions in 2012. And this was the first time that osteoporosis was also part of this. It included osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis as well. This 
these guidelines were targeting the healthcare providers and they were uh, demanded to address and respond to the priorities set in these guidelines. And for osteoporosis, it became a national priority with investigation using Fraxodexa intervention with the common drugs. And in the 2014 update, it was also added identification and systematic risk assessment as with FLS. This was then transferred down to the local healthcare authorities and I, the region I work in. We made our own guidelines or, work or care program for osteoporosis, prevention and treatment of low energy trauma fractures. This is just a course in Swedish, but it shows how we worked with it and how we've used a flowchart to be able to manage the patient. So it's much more down to a workable level and it's involving all the orthopedic departments in the regions that are managing uh, fragility fractures. The screening of fracture patients is included, and we use fracture patients above the age of 45. At, and it's all the, all the hospitals with orthopedic departments, low energy fractures, all hip fractures, regardless of age, and it's both in and out patients. For us, it's essential that we share responsibilities. The, in the hospital care here, it's the orthopedics that has to, ha has to have a fracture coordinator in place. The orthopedics is responsible for identification, screening, investigation, support, and their recommendations to primary care and other caregivers. And primary care is responsible for implementation of recommendations, initiating pharmacotherapy, and all other uh, preventive measures that are done by uh, allied healthcare professionals. With this experience, I can tell you that there are some key things that we have found that we needed to do, and logistics is one of these, uh, an essential in a systematic approach. The planning in advance, which I showed you before, process optimi optimization, so that there is a patient flow or a process flow where the patient can follow and that we can see that we can fine tune this and make it more and more effective as time goes by. In order to do so, we had to have the flow chart so we knew what to do with the different steps and depending on the, reply, the results of the uh, risk assessment and the investigation. We have done several screening forms depending on if it's outpatients or inpatients. And uh, we have trigger levels for when to do DEXA, no DEXA, only lifestyle and false intervention, or no DEXA where we treat directly, for example, some of the older uh, hip fracture patients where DEXA will not uh, change uh, the, the uh, intervention. We also have decision aids and helps for help for the for primary care and a portfolio of standard letters. And uh, I think that our FLS, as well as all those who are established, are always happy to share what, what we have done in order to facilitate for others. Because there is no need to reinvent all of it, although uh, the local adaptation is essential. We have assessed part of this program and seen that those who had osteoporosis and saw their doctor, two-thirds of them received anti-osteoporotic treatment, and none of those with normal bone density received treatment. So it's possible to evaluate also on a smaller scale what you're doing, although we in total in our region are having 8,000 fracture patients that we manage annually. So in summary, the burden of osteoporosis and fragility fractures is known. The intervention to reduce the risk are available and cost effective. The treatment gap is pronounced across most countries. And to close the gap, systems approaches and continued educational uh, effort need, uh, needs to be prioritized. Locally, the pre-planning to obtain an effective workflow, good organizers in your staff, and acceptance on all levels are essential, in addition to providing more modern IT so software solutions for registration, tracking, and monitoring the interventions. So with that, uh, I will say that fracture, secondary fracture prevention 
is successful if you do it systematically and have a local additive adaptation. This webinar is through Capture the Fracture. It's a program through the IOF to prevent secondary fractures due to osteoporosis. It was launched in 2012 and we're continuing to develop uh, materials and tools for all to be uh, implementing fracture liaison service and secondary prevention programs. One of them is to register for Capture the Fracture. I will not go through the process, it's on the website, but there are four different steps and we have, you can submit at any stage of your FLS and, and be measured against the standards. But even if you don't submit today, you can use the standards to benchmark and make it, uh, improve your own FLS. These are the flags that are sites that are registered today, 128 sites. And you can also see how they are scored. You can go into the map, look at them, see who is closest to you, and also take advantage of learning between. But you also see that they are, the best practice framework is feasible to use across the globe, any place where you are. So we also we suggest that you go in and, and register your FLS to get uh, mapped. We are also now continuing with additional webinars, one on September 7th on how to get mapped and get the recognition, which I just briefly mentioned, and also FLS Champions, a global, a global success stories that will be presented in November in this series. This is the steering committee. And uh, I'll thank all of those who are members of the steering committee for working in this program. And we also like to thank uh, our Capture the Fracture sponsors, Amgen and USB Pharma, MSD and Serbia. And with that, I thank you all for attending this webinar. And I'm pleased to entertain questions. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. And we will um, ask the question. There are a few questions that we have received. Uh, just before I ask question, I would like to emphasize again our sponsor. Then thank you so much for supporting this program and these webinars. And these are Amgen, UCB, Servier, and MSD. Thank you very much. So the first question is about um, the cost of implementing an FLS. So FLS is connected with an increased cost for FLS coordinator. Is, there, is FLS implementation a health priority for the European community? And are there any funding possibilities coming from this community? Currently, there is no uh, universal funding or EU funding available. Uh, IOF is working on mentorship program and possibly a grants program. Uh, currently, most people will have to try to get it within their budget systems or through raising the priority of FLS, getting funding through the healthcare authorities, which is possible because there are several calculations on health, uh, on health economics that show that FLS is Yes, they do increase the core cost to a certain extent for more DEXAs and for drugs, but the gains uh, clearly outweigh the costs. So it really shouldn't be an issue, but this is where we need to do to have the uh, the buy-in from those who are payers and realizing that prevention is more effective than just treating. Thank you, Christina. The next question is: In your experience. What is the best way to determine if a local FLS system is efficient or if it has to be optimized? What are the readouts for success? Well, uh, the first, first of all, you need to have your system in place and look at all the steps yourself on how to work efficiently. But then, of course, 
what I think the, the important tool we got today is from all the materials that's available through Capture the Fracture, uh, the best practice framework, but there are also other organizations working in a similar way, and we know that the best practice framework has been translated to a number of countries. It's also, there are also local adaptations known in other countries, uh, in Canada, in Australia, in the US. So measuring against those and getting the information there is uh, is helpful and will provide the uh, keys to work more efficiently. Thanks. How about high energy trauma fractures? There is data showing that there are many patients with low BMD in this group. Should we screen all patients? That is a difficult issue to, to address. I, I agree that quite a few of the high trauma patients will have uh, osteoporosis as well, but I think there is a degree uh, level of the trauma. We have seen that in men who get disarrages fractures, uh, regardless of trauma, the ones who have a fracture have a lower bone density than controls, but not at such a level where treatment is essential. So I think that the in the orthopedics, Compart uh, departments. It's possible to to uh, not screen all of the high high energy fractures, but to actually know which ones you could pick out and refer. If you have a coordinator, this is very easy to do. Uh, it's more difficult if you don't have a coordinator in place because you just let them go into the system if you have a suspicion. Another question is: Is it possible to have access to decision flow charts used by experienced FLS? it would be a valuable help for those starting in less structured environments. Uh, as I said, I think everyone who's having an FLS is uh, happy to share their material, to have site visits, and to provide all the help you can have. Um, it's, it's unnecessary to reinvent the wheel, but there needs always to be a, a local adaptation of the materials, but getting that start, head start and not thinking out all the steps from the beginning uh, is time saving and it's more the tweaking than to the local adaptation that will be the benefit and where you should put your energy. And if I may add, this will be part as well of the mentorship program of the Capture the Fracture program where we would like to finance and help new FLS to meet experienced FLS and learn by spending half a day there how it works. So we will, we will be talking about that more in the next webinar. Thank you, Christina. The next question is, um, thank you for the great presentation. While most FLS will start in the hospital setting, some are initiated by bone specialists in the retail setting. How would they apply at the CTF website in the context of the best practice framework? Well, uh the main purpose of the best practice framework and the, and the FLS thinking in global terms is that you should not miss any of the fracture cases. They should all be identified. And there are other settings where you see cases, more uh, incidental cases where they come in because if it's an osteoporosis setting. That's not a, a clear linkage with a, the systematic approach that's thought of. But if it's someone who has a large volume and can describe the uh, identification system and the possibility, it's possibly possible to be reviewed and also then to develop the system. Thank you, Christina. Um, another question asking, what were the most challenging difficulties that you have faced at the start of your FLS? Um, we started out by not having a coordinator, but trying to allocate specific persons at the different wards and at the outpatient. This didn't work. Having the coordinator in place was and uh, deciding on that and getting the time for that was the firstly, first the most challenging. The second part has been the, the transfer of information over to primary care. Although we have now, through the, uh, since we got the national guidelines and the priority of it, been much more successful in the, this collaboration and having a common ownership of uh, secondary prevention. So it's not only part of the orthopedics, but part of the 
care system in, and integrate it also into primary care. But this has been a challenge, challenge and it has taken quite some time to reach that level. And this, the one other thing was to make sure that we identify all patients and having a system for that because even though we have electronic records, uh, we do have to do manual searches as well in order not to lose patients. Okay. Thank you, Christina. One last question. In your experience, who are the most effective coordinator? Clinician, nurses? Uh, in, my, in my view, it is a nurse. Doctors have many other tasks, but the nurse can be spe specially dedicated for this and cover the large proportion, number of patients that are often involved in uh, orthopedic department and emergency rooms where you treat acute fractures. And uh, in our experience, this was the biggest change because we also tried to have the clinicians uh, remembering to do it, making ads at all the departments, the emergency rooms, etc. And this was not a credible system. It was never became fully integrated. And that's why a fracture liaison service where you have a coordinator, and I think this is the literature is supporting this all over that the coordinator, may, which is a nurse, a nurse-led coordinator system, is the most cost-effective system. Thank you very much, Christina, and thank you so much for this great presentation and answering all the questions. And a big thank you as well to all the participants. I hope it met your expectation. And if you have any further comments, please do email us and go on the CaptureTheFracture.org website where you can see more about the program. And if you want to join, please follow the next, stay tuned on the next webinar, which will be in September with Dr. Kasim Javed. Thank you very much and all have a good day or evening. Goodbye.